Hello and welcome to this edition of One on One. I'm Paranjay Guha Thakurta in the studio of Lok Sabha Television here in New Delhi. And in this edition of the program, we have an unusual economist. And with him, I'm going to discuss the state of the economy of the planet we live in. And of course, the country. How bad is bad? How long would that great recession continue? Can inflation in India be checked? These would be among the many questions I intend asking him. Let me welcome Dr. Shubroto Roy here. Thank you so much, Dr. Roy, for coming here. And for the benefit of our viewers, you graduated with a first from the London School of Economics in 1976. You got a PhD from the University of Cambridge, taught economics and or finance at the different colleges at the University of Cambridge, the Delhi School of Economics, Virginia Technology University, Cornell, uh, the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, among other places. And for a brief period of roughly six months when the former Prime Minister of India, Rajiv Gandhi, was the leader of the opposition in 1991, you were also his advisor. Thank you so much, Dr. Roy, for coming here. Thank you for having me, indeed. The Great Recession. Almost after eight decades, the world is still going through a crisis that was not seen till, you know, before the Second World War. And, and that recession is still going on uh, in more ways than one. Uh, Europe is in a double dip recession. So, so how bad would you describe the state of the world economy at present? You know, it, it really, Wall Street collapsed in the middle of September 2008, and we're sort of more than four years down the line, but that recession is continuing in many, many parts of the developed world, particularly in the US, uh, Western Europe, and other parts of the world as well. Well, I published a brief article in Business Standard going against that whole <laughs> assumption, I'm afraid, where I compared what happened in 29 with what's, what happened after 2008. And superficially, they're similar. But uh, really speaking, I think if you look at, at them a little more carefully, uh, there are deep and profound differences. And what we've had since 2008 is not anything like what there was back then. Uh, if you mean the U.S. recession, uh, the U.S., the Great Depression as such. That's correct. That has been analyzed. The as late 30s. Indeed. The early well, 40s. Well, starting 29, I think, with the stock market crash, going through the 30, 31, 33, uh, and then ending with the Second World War, really. The Second World War brings the world 1945. out. 1945. 39. 39 is when, when full employment comes back to the world, okay. 39, but, 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 but by then, the, wor the world was at war. Begun. Entirely. Yes. Exactly. So my point is that that uh, catastrophic structural change which happened in, let's say, the US and in Europe um, was, was so deep and relative to the capital stock at that time. The capital stock was relatively small. Between 19, my, that is my point. So if the capital stock falls or shrank, shrinks a, uh, as it did at that point, uh, given that the capital stock of the, of the economy in the world was relatively small to compare to what it is today. So if you look at the growth of capital between 1929 and 2008, it is vast. Capital, just the capital stock has grown vastly. So even if the, the size of the stock market crash is similar, relative to the capital that exists, it's not quite as much. To give you what I've said publicly is I've said that... Um, to, to compare that would be if there was a nuclear exchange between Russia and the West, and uh, New York was destroyed and London was destroyed, that catas catastrophe would compare with what happened in 29. So what's happened today is quite different, I think. But if one looks at, yes, the world has developed, obviously, over the last seven and decades Definitely. and longer, but the levels of unemployment, the way the Americans define recession, you know, negative uh, growth. I mean, that's an oxymoron, but right. you know, when the economy shrinks yeah. for six months, two successive quarters, when you see rates of unemployment go up, uh, uh, and, and it was preceded by a, a, a period of time when the so-called unreal economy, mm -hmm. the, the, the hot money flows across the mm -hmm. globe, mm -hmm. became 10 times bigger than the, the bricks and mortar, mm -hmm. the, the real economy. Indeed. So in that sense, yeah. uh, yes, there, there are obviously dissimilarities but there are also some similarities. So, so, so definitely. Um, but the, the levels of distress that were seen in the 20s and 30s were enormously large. You had 25% unemployment in the United States uh, alone. But, but wait, today officially it's 7%, but if you, yeah. if you, if you look at the data differently yeah. and you know those who've stopped looking for work, et cetera, et cetera, that figure might go up three times higher. 
Yes, indeed. Uh, there's also welfare net, there's so social security measures and so on. But let me come back to the, the origins of the present crisis. If we just leave, uh, just in and of itself, well, let's, let's leave aside what happened in 29, 31, 33. Uh, the origins of the present crisis are, as we were discussing earlier, very different in each situation. I mean, Japan, for example, has been, was the second largest economy in the world not, not long ago, but that has been in recession, in deep structural recession. For almost 10 years? 20 years. Okay. Since 89, 90, I would have thought, 90, uh, and, and the, co the reasons... But the has its economy been actually shrinking? Well, but it's kind of the Japanese standard. don't understand it. You see, nobody can comprehend how Japan, if you, uh, and if you look at Japan in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, this was the lead technologically advanced, uh, fast-growing economy in the world. There was nothing, uh, they had very high rates of GDP growth, 6, 7, 8% and so on. Something happens in the 90s. We, uh, th they're not clear as to what happened then. It could be the structure of Japanese organizations uh, that they ha they w uh, they always kept they always expected employment to continue li in a lifelong manner. That the structure of the firm was very different in Japan from what it was in the West, etc., because it was more f familial, feudal, etc. And Michio Morishima, my former professor at the London School of Economics, wrote a brilliant book on that a, a, a long time ago. So w the Japanese are still structurally, and uh, if you remember in the 80s there was something called the flying geese model for, for Asia. Japan was supposed to be the lead All goose, right. and then you had okay. no, Taiwan, I'm, I'm Korea. I'm going to come back to Asia. All right. but let, let's just for, for a while stick to the U.S. Oh, the U.S. Okay, and, and you had this mortgage, uh, the housing. Indeed. Uh, which yeah, was yeah, yeah, I mean, you had the subprime mortgage crisis. I mean, right. uh, America, after all, was the only part of the world where you know somebody can walk into a, a home after paying up a, a, a ridiculously small proportion of the market value yes. of the home, you yes. know, 1%, 2%, or uh, not even 3%. And you had this whole thing about, you know, the ninjas getting homes, you know, the no income, no jobs, no assets right. crisis getting. Right. And that was that great American dream. And really? when that bubble burst and Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, you know, sort of collapsed, and then it spread to Wall Street, mm -hmm. that contagion resulted in Wall Street collapsing. Now, that was one nature of the crisis. But you see in yes. Europe a different kind of a crisis, which is a sovereign debt crisis, yes. But the common factors are high rates of unemployment. Th those are the results of the outcomes of what is happening. But again, Japan on the one side, Europe, if I may just talk about Europe for a minute before the United States. Europe really has its problem originating even before the Euro, where you have East Germany and West Germany integrating after X number of, of decades. Uh, and East, East Germany and, East and Czechoslovakia and all the other East European countries were in terrible shape. For that integration to take place was itself an enormous sort of trauma which happened uh, as they were slowly doing it. They, they had to do it because it was politically important. And then on top of that, we have the Euro being almost imposed upon the peoples of the countries by the governments and the bureaucrats. Without and the political side. unity. And Without you, you, political yeah, unity. You, you, had, you had sort of economic unity, uh, a kind of unified Enforced. market, literally being, yes, forced on the throat. Indeed. You of see a diverse set of people. Yes, and there is a kind of, there is supposed to be a kind of logic between, in advancing towards a monetary union. Namely, you start with a kind of free trade area, you have a customs union, then you can have a common market, and then gradually you come to an economic union, finally you have a monetary union. Right. And they were going very rapidly uh, as soon as okay. the Berlin Wall collapsed in 89-90. There was a, this kind of r mad rush to unify and to forget differences and so And this, the results are, are, are manifest before us. So, so you're saying two and a half decades later, or three decades later, we are seeing this as a, a problem of the, uns you, you can say, the unseemly haste in which to create yes, a, an indeed. economic union. Indeed, part, uh, for, for sure, partly. So, so the weaker economies, whether it be the pigs' economies, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, Spain, pulling down, and, and the strong economies, gre uh, France and Germany, trying to keep the rest. Uh, well, uh, what I'm saying afloat. is, that, yeah, what I'm saying is that there was a move towards unification, which was politically driven by all by all parties, which was very short-sighted, and it did not see how structurally different, let's say, West Germany and East Germany were. So now, what has happened? West Germany, East Germany integrate almost by compulsion. And then uh, we, Germany becomes the major banker for the rest of Europe and, and, and has to carry all the others. So Europe's problems are different in structure again. Mm -hmm. Now the US problem is again very long standing. It goes through democratic administrations, it goes through republican administrations, where there was this vast subsidy, of, as you said, of low cost housing, which is a social good. There's no doubt that low cost housing is a good thing for if, if it could be done. At the same time, how they did it uh, and how they didn't finance their, uh, their, their 
the, the deficits that resulted, it seems to me, had something to do with the fact the dollar is such a reserve currency of the world. All right. So I'm, I'm going to come to that in greater detail. But, but economists like Raghuram Rajan, uh, Professor Rajan, who is now an advisor to uh, Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh, would argue that an another factor that contributed to the Great Recession in the United States is the sharp rise in inequalities. I mean, that's yes, he yes. sees that as an important factor. Yes, and uh, the inequalities are not just of income, but also of information and awareness of and how to function mm -hmm. in this capitalist economy. Which is, you know, I was in the U.S. for 16 years. I, I, um, let me, to give you a specific example on housing, I was able to purchase without much income at all. On ten thousand dollars down, I bought an apartment for one hundred sixteen thousand dollars in 1986 and was able to sell it for $275,000 three years later. This is entirely speculative profit, which, uh, and wh what, that, what I'm trying to su suggest is that the real estate market, which is where most people's wealth tends to be, and uh, it's a vital asset in anybody's budget as to how, where you live and what, 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 how much that value costs. That real estate market had a lot of just genuine uncertainty created. It became a gambling den, as you said. Uh, a casino, yes. A casino, as you said. And how that happened was because at the same time you have technology advancing vastly, mm -hmm. you have uh, new monetary instruments being created by financial firms uh, which do not know uh, quite what, they, what the ramifications are mm -hmm. on, on a national basis. And then you have Fannie Mae and, Fa and Freddie Mac, as you said. And you had the CD CDOs yeah. and, and the CDSs and all that <laughs> kind of thing. I, I'll tell you what, Dr. Dr. Roy. I'm going to take you up on some of these questions. Sure. The key question that I want to ask you is what we see. Is this a crisis in the system or a crisis of the system? Is it the biggest crisis capitalism has faced? Or, or are we seeing that capitalism can never be the same again and why it cannot be the same again? I mean, these are some of the questions I need to ask you. And our notions of public and our notions sure. of private, these are some uh, of the questions I want to ask you. And I want to, from there, move to Asia, move to China and India, and also look at the lessons that a country like India needs to learn from what's happened across the world. But I need to take a commercial break at this juncture, so I'm going to get back to you in a very short while from now. We're looking at the economy of the world and its implications for India. Stay with us. We'll be back with you in a short while from now. Welcome back to this discussion on the state of the economy of this planet we live in and the country we live in. I have with me here in the studio Dr. Subrata Roy. He's an economist. He's taught in different places in different parts of the world, currently based in Kolkata. He taught at the Indian Institute of Technology in Kharagpur. He's also taught at the Delhi School of Economics. He's written on different aspects of the political economy of India and the world. And he's also worked with the World Bank and the IMF, and that's not all. He's worked in Wall, Wall Street as well. Wall Street, okay, Wall Street, Wall Street, and you know the greedy investment bankers. They've they've become the villains of the world. They've been held responsible for much of the mess. They've devastated families across the globe. Their greed is not just you know uh, uh, just stuff made you know of Hollywood films and you know 
with all, all the green and good, good kind of stuff. Uh, the fact is today, there's a movement, you can call it a marginal movement, but the Occupy Wall Street movement has found resonance across the globe. Maybe they've posited the issue uh, in a somewhat exaggerated manner, 1% versus 99%. But today we see a huge amount of anger and outrage at what many people consider the greed and the venality of a few uh, on Wall Street and, uh, and the way in which they design these complex derivative instruments which spread like cancer across the world economic system before it all collapsed. Your views? Well, I can tell you my views and I can tell you my experience and also what I teach. Um, my experience was several months in New York in one of the firms which became notorious recently. And I got the job in the research department of this company, which I won't mention. Um, You're welcome to mention. I don't want to. If I don't mind, I'll tell you why. I, are you, you ashamed? No, no, I'm not. I'm not. But it, it, uh, I'll tell you why. Um, I, how, how it w it'll give you an indication of how the place works. Uh -huh. Because I came in from academia, and I came in with very, again, short experience at the IMF and the World Bank. But it, um, Wall Street, you get a job partly because of your credentials and partly with whom you know, as it is in the business world generally. Good old caste system. Indeed. Well, who knows whom, and it's a referral system. So I, I was with the research department of one of the top firms. And you have essentially the structure of the firms. You have a, a trading desk, which does the trading. You have research. You have back office and all of these different departments, as you can tell. And this was 94, specifically. And uh, it was a very, very fine uh, uh, corporation, if you look at how corporations work, in the sense that it had glass everywhere, no office was closed, everything was open. Except the corner offices with the well, big Well, even boss. those, even those, the boss, everything was structurally designed such that there was a, a team atmosphere. Now, what happens is you are essentially in that very high tension there's a lot of uh, verbal abuse, incidentally, uh, because the tension is so high that people are always using invectives. And uh, expletives. Yes, indeed. And, and I the would, F word. I would the speak S to you saying, yeah, I want to go the and B get... Words. Yes, all the thousands, uh, dozens, in, in humorous form, of course. It's very funny. Uh, but I couldn't figure it out at first, because you know, everyone was cursing all the time. To get a cup of coffee, you would, you would F curse. Dot dot K all you. the time. Oh, that's F dot dot coffee. <laughs> that's the you know, so it's it, you are all and then I realized what is happening. What is it's just to release attention <coughs> because people are so in, in, the, in, in that pressure cooker in, exactly, and and it is there's lots of information. You don't leave your desk for meals. What happens in the morning is on your screen will come the menus of numerous fine restaurants, which the company has arranged for you: French, Italian, Chinese, Japanese, or whatever. And you then, at breakfast, you order your, your lunch, which will come on to you at, at your place of work. For uh, so, you, so there's no movement from, you, from your desk back to you. There's no waste of time. In this kind of environment, ultimately what you're doing is what, in Bengali, we'd say mudikana. You're <laughs> buying low and selling high and trying to make a profit. That is what people are doing. So even though it's very sophisticated to look at, it's very deep and, and rich, and the environment is very, is very uh, fine, Ultimately, they are still. Everyone is still trying to buy low and sell high. All right. Now, now, now the point is. If you see what I'm saying. Yes, I, I understand what you're saying. But economists have got a terrible name in the recent past. You know, though. At least, if I remember correctly, you'll probably correct me if I'm wrong. There were half a dozen economists who were awarded the Nobel Prize for their, you know, work on these so-called exotic financial instruments, these de de derivatives, yes, these yeah, collateralized debt mm -hmm. obligations, these credit default swaps. Yeah. I mean, some of their own firms went bust. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, there was a huge amount of mystification. But you were just creating pieces of paper out of more pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, as they would say in good old Bengali or Hindi, that it became raddi, right? Mm -hmm. It was worth nothing. Well, um, that's complicated. Uh, I taught at IIT and in England uh, the theory of financial derivatives. And it's a very beautiful theory. As theory goes, it is an application of economic theory. It is very nicely understood. It, it needs to be understood if you want to work in the market. But in actual practice? That, good, that, that's what I'm coming to. So in, uh, in, in practice, there have been derivatives uh, forever. Because a, der a, der a derivative has nothing to do with calculus here. A derivative is simply a derived price. A price derived from what? A price derived from an already quoted price. So for example, if a farmer wants to fix, let us say, not wheat or rice, but let's say a price of corn, uh, he's not sure what the price of corn will be when his corn crop comes up. But he knows what the price of corn is today. 
then he may want to go into a, a, a forward contract or a futures contract to fix the price that he is going to get. So he's, he's comfortable about, about uh, the price and there's no risk involved. For that, he will pay a small premium. So it's like an insurance contract. All right. It's, it's what you call hedging. Exactly. Now, hedging is one thing. Now, again, in foreign trade, you know, an importer, an exporter, they want to fix the price so that they don't get, they don't, they're not subject to the fluctuation mm -hmm, of prices. Mm -hmm. They have to pay a premium, a small premium, in order to ensure the price that they get. And that is normal, standard derivative m markets at work, which is essential. What went wrong? Well, several things, numerous things. One of the things was that these things then started getting resold and resold and repackaged and, re and they started getting more and more complicated. Everyone, again, going back to the idea of buying low and selling high and trying to make a quick profit and getting out. All right. Are you with me? That's yes, absolutely. Quick, quick profit, get out. So then I'm not comprehending how these instruments are then sort of becoming a, mon a Frankenstein monster coming, which are essential, uh, as I said, the hedging of the farmer or the hedging of the trade, import export. <coughs> so so uh, would you argue that the point I made earlier, that your real economy became one tenth the size of your unreal economy, the, those flows of hot money mm -hmm. that were created, and it's not I, it's the bank, bank for international settlements, and numerous studies have indicated that that's what really characterized what happened in 2008, well, and, and differentiates it from what has happened in the past before. Well, when you say real brick and mortar versus the remainder, uh, I think on oh, the positive you, side. You can call it a shadow economy. Call it what well, you on like. the positive side, uh, what we've seen in the last 20 years is a vast technological change, which happened because of the Cold War ending. The Cold War ends, and the US and whoever, they release the technology that they had developed for their defense purposes. The and internet. And it becomes the internet. It becomes the internet. It becomes Excel worksheets. It becomes, uh, you know, we are now able to do accounting. We are now able to do, we can have another session on what the economics of information technology has been. The value of, information is very hard to produce, but it is very inexpensive to disseminate. So the cost of, produc uh, cost of production of information is high, but the cost of dissemination is very low. So now what we had is this vast amount of information around the world, which is now being distributed at, at almost zero cost. All right. Let me stop you here and ask you the second term of President Barack Obama and the proverbial fiscal cliff and his apparent determination to tax the rich uh, something that he's facing immense resistance, not only from the Republicans, but sections within his own political party. What would you, in simple lay language, explain what is happening and what's likely to happen? Well, thank you. I, I've been actually very active with American Friends on Facebook on this. And I, I'm seen as a Republican in some respects, but in this respect, I'm a, I'm a Republican Obama, even though I'm Indian. I'm not, I'm not a voter. I've never been a voter in the U.S. But the point is that the Republicans, I think, and to some extent the conservatives in Britain, uh, they've made a bit of a fetish of the deficit. Because, it, and then to come back to what we were talking about earlier, uh, before we went on air, uh, deficits and debts and public finances are gravely important in India and China. They are not as important, it seems to me, in Western economies, which are far more advanced than us. Why I say that is because if there is high unemployment and distress in the US, as there has been for the last several years, or in Europe, um, it seems to me that to talk about the deficit being um, something which is precipitous and to bring in the word fiscal cliff, in, which was has been brought in, I think <coughs> it's, 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 scare, it's scaremongering to some extent, that um, there's always going to be a future. There is no such thing as a fiscal cliff, uh, if I took that point of view. There's always a future. And I will contrast that with India and China in a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk. Right. I'm, I'm going to get you to talk to in about India and China, but I want you to talk about the nature of capitalism. You know, here we have, uh, say, General Motors. Okay, it it, it symbolized free enterprise capitalism. Uh, in in the recent past, the Amer American taxpayer and the public. Se it, it is a public sector organization by all indicators. Mm -hmm. Indicate. I, I mean, it's been bailed out. I mean, so the, I mean, here is a classic example. I mean, how would you call General Motors? Would you call it a a public sector company, a private sector company, and this wh our whole notion of public and private has, has, haven't it all undergone a um, metamorphosis of sorts, yes. especially yes. over the last few years? Absolutely. I, I, um, capitalism is a very complex word, I think. If we talk about the, ro this, the, the role between the individual and the state, the relationship between the individual and the state, that seems to me more interesting in some ways, because the individual tends to get generally speaking, shafted by the state or by, power <coughs> by, by coalitions and by power blocks. And whether the power block is, is one of organized capital or organized labor um, uh, or the state itself, the state bureaucratic app app apparatus, that may differ from place to place. 
But in a way, my concern right throughout my, my life, in fact, has been one, or my adult life, has been one in which I've been deeply concerned about the individual as an individual. And the individual, meaning the family, the individual family, the concerns around that small environment, uh, is needs to be generally grasped as some, some as an entity which is, generally speaking, rational, quote unquote. It knows what its interests are. It knows what its capacities are. It knows what its opportunities are, generally speaking. And for that, and generally speaking, as long as the environment is stable and legal and, mm -hmm. and society is not badgering this, this particular, <coughs> this particular mm -hmm. individual or family, they get on pretty well with their own lives. All right. You know, since you brought in the family, since you brought a bit of sociology and society mm -hmm. into our discussion which on politics and economics, before I take a break, which will be in about a minute or so from now, I wanted to ask you, what do you say the essential difference between countries like America, Europe to some extent, and countries like India and China, we're going to discuss this in greater detail, is an attitude. In the US, I, you say I owe, I owe, therefore to work I go, so I borrow for my education, my car, my home, my vacation, uh, maybe because of account of the absence of the kind of social security systems that developed countries have. In India and China, we listen to our grandmother who mm -hmm. says, you must save for a rainy day, you must keep aside a bit mm -hmm. for you know, the unforeseen, uh, and, and, and that is uh, a key difference. I mean, you have uh, China saving 40% of the country's GDP, India saving roughly a third of her GDP, is, whereas countries like the US are dissaving. I mean, it's, its total debt is way above its GDP. Well, that's very interesting. I actually have uh, protested this idea that India and China are saving as much as they are, because I think something's being mismeasured. What is being mismeasured is bank deposits. Bank deposits have zoomed, and I will explain that if you want later. But coming back to, uh, yes, the family has collapsed in the West, uh, or at least is, has in, been in the process of collapsing. And that may be an attendant sort of result of the growth of, of wealth and income and the freedom of women. And I think one has to look at the role of women in society and see how traditional societies are coping with change in that respect. So all these things are very important. Uh, it happened in the US and in the West, I think, during the Second World War where the men went off to fight and the women came into the workforce as a result. And as soon as women's incomes went up and women's employment went up, as they did in the, in, during the Second World War, then families also started collapsing. Uh, so in a sense, you've got, I think, friends in sociology and economic sociology in those fields would be able to analyze that better as to how, what the relationship is between the freedom of women and the collapse of society, the choices you want to see it differently. All right. I'm going to take a break now, a second break in our discussion. In the next segment, let's discuss India, China, and the rest of the world. Yes. And then we'll talk about India specifically. Dr. Roy, I'll be back with you in a short while from now. We're looking at the state of the economy of the world, and we're looking at the lessons that India needs to learn from what's happening across the globe. Stay with us. We'll be back. <laughs> Welcome back to our discussion on the economy of the world and in India with me here in the studio of Lok Sabha Television, I have Dr. Subrata Roy, no relation to the person who heads the <laughs> Sahara Group, I should <laughs> clarify. Dr. Roy graduated with a first uh, uh, in economics from the London School of Economics. He has a PhD from Cambridge. He's taught in different parts of the world at the Delhi School of Economics, at the Cambridge Colleges, at Virginia Tech, at Cornell, at um, uh, Hawaii, at IIT Kharagpur, at Buckingham, among other places. Well, uh, Dr. Roy, you know, we have a very unequal planet. We have the United States of America with about 300 million people, uh, less than 5% of the world's population of 7 billion. Uh, its GDP is still about a quarter of world GDP, you know, roughly 15 to 16 trillion out of 